Hello, my name is Cindy Peterson, and I am going to be talking to you today about characterization of liver masses with contrast-enhanced ultrasound, and specifically about what sonographers need to know. I have been a sonographer at Southwoods Imaging in Youngstown, Ohio with Dr. Richard Barr for over 20 years, and we started doing contrast agent studies with ultrasound in 1997. When FDA approval was granted for cardiology and not radiology in the early 2000s, we continued to do studies in an off-label manner, and therefore we have dosed thousands of patients. So it is that experience about which I'd like to speak with you today. Our objectives of the program will be to explain the mechanism of the action of ultrasound contrast agents and appropriate scanning techniques so they are understood to help you understand the patient populations who may benefit from contrast-enhanced ultrasound, and to discuss liver lesion enhancement patterns using contrast-enhanced ultrasound. This is a photograph from Haleakala in Maui. And first of all, depending on where you are viewing this presentation, it may not be sunny, but more importantly, this represents to me the journey in contrast agent imaging and ultrasound. Those of us that have been using Contrast Agent for years know that we have climbed the mountain and worked with the equipment vendors to get the equipment to the point that it is today. And we are at the precipice with the approval of Contrast Agents for liver lesion characterization in the United States. We have reached a new point in ultrasound. And if this is not adopted, and if people are not adequately educated, I fear we're going to fall off of this precipice. So that is my purpose in sharing this information with you. I like to approach this in a who, what, where, when, how, and why approach. And we're actually going to talk about why twice. The first why is why am I talking to you about this today? And the answer is because FDA approval was granted in April of 2016 for the first ultrasound contrast agent to be used in a radiology application, which was the characterization of focal liver lesions in both adult and pediatric patients. This indication was followed later that year by the indication for vesicoureteral reflux imaging in pediatric patients. What are ultrasound contrast agents? These are gas-filled microbubbles that are smaller than the size of a red blood cell. They have a lipid shell on the outside and a gas in the core. The gas depends on the particular agent that is being used. Some of you might be thinking the same thing I thought when Dr. Barr first said that we are going to be using ultrasound contrast agents. There have been a few times over my ultrasound career in which a radiologist or another physician has told me of a new innovation, and I've literally had to stop and ask what they were talking about. The first of all was transvaginal. For those of you that predate transvaginal sonography, when you were first told we're going to place a transducer into the vagina, it seemed like a foreign concept, but now it is standard of care. The same thing is true with ultrasound contrast agents. When I was told we were going to be injecting air bubbles into a patient, the radiographer in me became fearful. However, if you look at the size distribution on this slide, the microbubbles are smaller than the red blood cells. Therefore, there is no concern for the microbubbles to become trapped in pulmonary circulation and the risks that we have with air emboli in other situations do not occur here. And in fact, in a paper that was published about 10 years ago, we can see the size distribution of both microbubbles as well as red blood cells. The red blood cells are denoted with the darker arrows, and the microbubbles are denoted with the white arrows. And we can see this, the size distribution is actually very similar. I also want to draw your attention to the fact that these bubbles are from the contrast agent Sonoview. Sonoview in Europe is the same agent as Lumison in the United States. It is the first agent to be approved for radiology indications in the United States. Due to the FDA request to change the name, if you look at literature from Europe, you will find articles about Sonoview as one of the agents being used. It is the same agent as Lumison in the US. Ultrasound contrast agents are injected intravenously, either into the antecubital vein or even a vein in the wrist or hand if needed. 
These are blood pool agents, meaning they circulate throughout the bloodstream and they're not excreted into the collecting system as CT contrast is. As the microbubbles are circulating, they interact with the sound beam and produce harmonic signals. The oscillations of the microbubbles will increase the signal noise ratio, and this nonlinear response of the bubbles will produce harmonic frequencies. Prior to having harmonic imaging as a standard imaging package on our ultrasound systems, harmonic imaging was used as a method of contrast agent visualization in research. When the approval for radiology was not granted, the equipment vendors went ahead with the harmonic imaging technology and it became standard of care long before contrast agents were available to us. When the microbubbles oscillate in the sound field, we can see on this diagram that if we're using a very low energy or power or a very low mechanical index, there's not much oscillation. We go to an intermediate mechanical index around 0.1, we start to have some oscillations. And if those oscillations become so powerful that the bubble actually bursts, we are not going to be able to use that microbubble information. That happens when the mechanical index is higher. That means that as sonographers, we have to pay attention to the mechanical index, which we typically don't do unless we're doing obstetric ultrasound. This, however, has already been pre-loaded into the contrast packages that are on the ultrasound systems. Every manufacturer now has a push-button contrast software package, and when you enter the contrast software package, the mecha mechanical index automatically goes down to a level that is acceptable, usually around 0.1 or just below that. So we're going to keep the MI in this level, as we see in the orange box. The safety profiles of ultrasound contrast agents have been established. There have been decades of patients scanned, and especially in the US, the patients who have been dosed for cardiology serve as a reference base as well. There's a short half-life of ultrasound contrast agents, typically lasting around five minutes in circulation meaning we can use multiple injections. If a patient has more than one lesion to be characterized, we can do an injection and characterize the first lesion and then either try to destroy the bubbles with a higher MI or just wait for the bubbles to dissipate and then perform a second injection. The why of ultrasound contrast agents answers the question of why do we need contrast agents in ultrasound? It is different than in cardiology. In cardiology, contrast agents are used to help improve a suboptimal examination. That is not true in radiology. Ultrasound contrast agents do not compensate for poor sonographic technique. These are used to characterize lesions, and again, focal liver lesions in particular in adults and pediatrics have been approved by the FDA, as well as looking for vesico ureteral reflux in pediatric patients. There are a number of patients who cannot have CT or MRI contrast, either due to renal insufficiency or if there is an allergy to iodinated contrast media. In our practice, we have seen that these patients have greatly improved ability to have diagnoses by using ultrasound contrast agents. The literature has shown that ultrasound contrast agents are very effective, both in terms of sensitivity and specificity to characterize lesions. So when ultrasound or CT or MRI have not characterized the lesion, ultrasound contrast agents can do this as well. The cost of ultrasound is significantly lower than the cost of either CT or MRI. By adding in the additional cost of a vial of contrast agent, which is currently reimbursable, we still have a much lower cost margin than if the patient were to be subsequently referred for a CT or an MRI exam. In pediatric patients, the image gently directive says that if there is a manner in which a patient can be imaged without using ionizing radiation, that should be the first imaging modality that is used. There is no conscious sedation required for ultrasound as compared to imaging modalities like CT or MRI also. 
In addition, patients who have undergone interventional procedures such as radiofrequency ablations or cryoablations or microwave ablations or endovascular stent repairs can be evaluated with real-time mechanisms to look for blood flow and assure that the interventional procedure has been successful. Other ischemic defects such as infarcts or transplants can be evaluated as well and the real-time assessment adds a dimension that we don't have with CT or MRI. Before we talk about specific lesions, we need to review the liver lobule. Each liver lobule has six corners and at each corner we have the portal triad. We have a branch of the proper hepatic artery, we have a branch of the portal vein, and we have a bile duct. Arterial blood is delivered to the liver through a branch of the hepatic artery. At the same time that arterial blood has traveled down the aorta and through the SMA and IMA delivering blood to the intestines, that intestinal blood then is drained through the portal system. So the second blood that arrives at the liver lobule is the portal venous blood. This blood then is distributed throughout the hepatocytes and so the third place in which the blood is delivered is to the liver parenchyma. This means that we have three specific phases on contrast-enhanced imaging methods. In this graphic, we can see that the unenhanced image, whether it is CT or MRI or even an ultrasound without color Doppler, shows really no difference between the viscera and the vessels. Immediately after injection, we have the arterial phase and we can see that we are going to have blood and therefore contrast in the aorta, in the hepatic artery, also in the mesenteric arteries and the splenic artery. During the portal venous phase, the portal veins will become apparent as blood is draining into the liver from the intestines. And then as that blood is distributed to the liver parenchyma, we have the late phase, which is also known as equilibrium. Notice that the hepatic arteries and portal veins are not evident any longer. We can see the hepatic veins and this parenchymal blush within the hepatic parenchyma. This is the basis of a multiphasic CT. On your left, you can see a CT exam without contrast. In the center, you can see the arterial phase, so we can see hepatic arterial blood. And then we can see the portal venous structures during the portal venous phase. There is not a late phase reflected here. Notice that in this patient's liver lesion, we have a difference of appearance on the phases, and different lesions will have different enhancement patterns, which is the basis of our ability to characterize these lesions. So if we can see this on CT, we can see this on ultrasound as well. Each ultrasound system that has a contrast package has a timer, and we can see the timer in the corner on the system. And so this is about 19 seconds and 20 seconds after injection. This is the arterial phase. Here we can see the portal venous phase. And then in the late phase or equilibrium, which is about two minutes after injection in this patient, we can see that we have parenchymal flow and no apparent vessels, um, particular vessels, in this image. These liver vascular phases have been well defined in the literature. The arterial phase begins about 10 to 20 seconds following the injection of contrast agents and ends about 30 to 45 seconds after the injection. This depends on the patient's cardiac output and their overall health. The portal venous phase then commences about 30 to 45 seconds after an injection and will last about two minutes after the injection. At this point, we are into the late phase or the equilibrium phase, which will persist as long as the bubbles are evident. Please do not worry too much about the timing. Um, if we have a patient who is 32 seconds post-injection, don't worry about which phase is this patient in at the moment. We're most interested in what's happening to the lesion as we are examining the patient. And you'll see that as we look at some case studies. Benign lesions we're going to talk about include hemangiomas, focal nodular hyperplasias, adenomas, and cysts. 
Malignant lesions we're going to talk about are hepatocellular carcinomas, metastases, and we also, in our pediatric population, will have hepatoblastomas, and the one lesion that's not reflected on this slide is cholangiocarcinomas. And all of these have um, some similar features, as we'll see. There was a trial that was published in 2008 that has a very nice graphic to show us the enhancement patterns. On the top of the slide, we can see the benign lesions, and on the bottom of the slide, we see the two most common malignant lesions. Focal nodular hyperplasias are often hallmarked by what we call a spoked wheel appearance or a stellate appearance. This stems from angiography. And in this diagram, we can see the central portion with vessels that extend peripherally. We can see this with contrast enhanced ultrasound. Notice also that throughout the time of enhancement, this lesion is going to remain enhanced, and that's what this is telling us here. Hemangiomas fill in from the outside in. They have centripetal enhancement. This is reflected in the diagram as well. And these are the same patterns that we can appreciate on CT and MRI, but CT and MRI often don't capture that spoke wheel appearance we see in an FNH. Malignant lesions are going to take up the contrast and then dump it off. And if you think about the AV shunting that occurs within a malignant lesion, that is logical. Metastases are going to have rapid enhancement, often with irregular vessels, and then that lesion is going to have loss of the contrast, or what we term washout. Hepatocellular carcinomas have the same pattern, irregular vessels wash in, but the washout may be more lengthy than with the metastasis. The washout may take two or three or even four or five minutes, so it's important that we follow these lesions for a longer period of time. The nine lesions then are going to remain enhanced in the late phase, but what we see in the arterial phase depends on the type of lesion. If it's an FNH, we'll have central stellate filling, and if it's a hemangioma, we will have centripetal filling from the outside in in a globular fashion. Malignant lesions will have rapid uptake with an irregular vessel pattern, relatively rapid washout. However, the washout is more rapid with a metastasis than with an HCC. Before we talk about specific cases, I want to make a few practical points to orient you to viewing ultrasound contrast images. We're going to use low MI continuous scanning, meaning that when we look at a dual image, the side where we're going to view contrast looks black prior to injection. That is by design. We're listening only for the harmonic signals in that portion of the screen. We're going to use a dual screen in most cases to allow a point of reference. We're going to place the transducer prior to the injection and keep that transducer in a single plane. That is very important to be able to characterize the lesion and also for time intensity curves that we're going to discuss later. We want to have that lesion in plane, meaning that as the patient breathes, the lesion is still visible. This is typically best achieved in a longitudinal plane, occasionally an oblique plane. We generally do not dose in a transverse plane because as that patient breathes, the lesion will move in and out of our field of view. The cine clip length may be set for up to three minutes, but we may need to image longer in patients who have hepatocellular carcinomas. Our field of view is not less than 10 centimeters. This is to ensure that our PRF is low enough that we're not bursting more bubbles than we need to. And similarly, the focus is placed at the most posterior part of the image, not at the area we are examining, to keep from bursting bubbles unnecessarily. We're going to look at a number of case studies. We're going to start with our benign lesions. And cysts are cysts are cysts, and we typically don't need contrast to determine that. But if you have a cyst that has echoes within it, contrast may be helpful. When we look at a contrast-enhanced image, everywhere we have blood flow will enhance, as we see here. We can also see the vessels that have a greater concentration of blood than the parenchyma. Everywhere we don't see blood flow is going to appear as black or anechoic. This is anechoic not because it's fluid, but because it doesn't have blood flow. That's going to be important to us in a few minutes. 
Notice also that when we get down to about somewhere between 12 and 15 centimeters, we lose the resonance of the bubble. So deep lesions are not well visualized with contrast. We may need to put that patient into a decubitus position in order to better visualize the lesion. We don't see many echinococcal cysts in our practice, so I went to the literature for this one. But this is not a typical cyst. However, if you look at the contrast enhanced image, the lack of flow tells us this is not live tissue. This patient has a hemangioma. She has a history of a hemangioma, and this was a follow-up of her known hemangioma. This has a typical appearance of a hemangioma. We can see a well-circumscribed lesion. This is scanning subcostally. This is scanning intercostally. And notice that the lesion is closer to the transducer and will be easier to keep in plane when we're scanning intercostally. When we enter our contrast software package, you'll notice that this side is initially black. That is on purpose. And so as we watch the contrast injection, the left side of the screen in this package is going to be optimized only for contrast. This is the timer. Every system has a timer. And at the completion of the contrast agent injection, at the beginning of the saline flush, the timer is activated. So we're going to see this timer as we start. So we are two seconds after an injection, and as I said, it takes about 10 to 20 seconds for the contrast agent to arrive. We can see a little backflow into the hepatic veins. That means it's coming. And now we can see flow in the hepatic arteries. So this is the arterial phase. We can see the lesion, and by keeping the transducer in a single plane, we can watch this lesion without the patient holding her breath. We know that we're going to need to examine this over a longer period of time, so a breath hold is not going to be very beneficial to us. Now we are in the portal venous phase. We can see flow in the portal veins. And if we look at our lesion, we can see that we do not have enhancement in the center, but we have this peripheral enhancement, this centripetal globular enhancement. And if you've been watching the lesion, you notice that it is enhancing more as the patient um, is scanned for a longer period of time. This is a typical enhancement pattern for a hemangioma. And hemangiomas will typically fill um, over a period of several minutes. If there's a small area of thrombosis, we may not have filling in that area. And I'm not going to make, make you watch the entire three minute clip, but you will see that there is filling. Focal nodular hyperplasias can be subtle lesions and can be difficult to characterize with imaging. This patient had a CT urogram because she had had some kidney stones and a liver mass was noted. She was asymptomatic for liver disease. Here we can see this left lobe isoechoic lesion that's about three centimeters in size. I put some calipers on here for us. It is a little better seen in transverse and in the transverse plane it actually measures five centimeters. Color Doppler does not reveal anything that is very helpful. And those of you who have scanned FNHs know that um, typically it is not possible to say, aha, here's an FNH, but ultrasound contrast actually makes that possible. So again, we're going to optimize our system so the contrast side is pretty much black. We are seven seconds after injection right now. So the contrast will be arriving and we can see flow, here's flow in the heart, flow in the hepatic arteries. And I'm going to freeze this for a moment. Okay, so our point of reference is right here. The reconstructed B mode is never as high in quality as the regular B mode image. It is just not possible to do that. I'm actually going to back up our video just a little bit. And right here, we can see the spokes of a wheel. Okay, that is the stellate pattern that is characteristic of an FNH. It is a very short period of time. If you capture video clips, however, you can go back and store stills after the examination is completed to acquire these very important images that are necessary for diagnosis. Sometimes it's easier to see those after the exam is completed rather than just watching in real time. So as the contrast injection progresses, 
we can see the lesion is remaining enhanced. Okay, we're into the portal venous phase now, and this lesion is still remaining enhanced. And benign lesions will remain enhanced even after the rest of the liver begins to lose some of its contrast effect. We are almost a minute post-injection now. And notice that the rest of the liver is starting to lose a little contrast, but the lesion is remaining enhanced. That is typical for a benign lesion. So here we can see um, at 35 seconds post-injection, but even two minutes post-injection, the lesion is still enhanced compared to the surrounding liver. And this confirms to us this is a benign lesion. It's that spoke wheel appearance that tells us it's an FNH. Adenomas are less commonly encountered in ultrasound as compared to FNHs. This patient had a history of oral contraceptive use that was discontinued in 2014. And the reason she discontinued it is because she had severe right upper quadrant pain when a right hepatic lobe adenoma had ruptured and was bleeding. That mass was removed. At the time of her surgery, she had several other masses that were noted and biopsied intraoperatively that were noted to be adenomas as well. She did not have a history of glycogen storage disease, so this was termed hepatic adenomatosis. She has several small hypoechoic lesions. This is the largest of the lesions, and this was a follow-up on a known adenoma. We can see about a two centimeter lesion close to her diaphragm. In transverse, we can see this lesion as well. We're not going to want to dose this patient transverse for two reasons. Number one, the heart is very close by, so we wouldn't want to mistake any motion from cardiac activity and, um, and have that show up in our mass. But also, transverse is not going to allow us to track that lesion as much as we would like to. There were other smaller lesions in her right lobe. We can see these hypoechoic lesions that were also adenomas. In this system, the timer is going to pop up at the beginning of the clip. It's going to be in the left lower corner. And this is three seconds after injection. Our point of reference tells us we're looking right here. We can see flow in her heart. And now we're going to see flow starting to come into the liver as well. So here's the hepatic arterial flow. Here is our region of interest. And we can see this region is enhancing greater than the surrounding liver parenchyma. Notice that our focal zone is well below the lesion that we are examining. Okay, and as we transition into the portal venous phase, we can see that this lesion remains enhanced. The patient's actually holding her breath at the moment. Okay, but we know that patients can't sustain that for three minutes, so it's better to use shallow breathing than to have the patient hold his or her breath and then have to do some catch-up breathing. As we continue to watch this lesion, we can see that it has similar enhancement to the remainder of the liver. Adenomas do not remain quite as enhanced as FNHs. And two minutes post-injection, there is no washout of this lesion either. That tells us it's a benign lesion. Metastases and hepatocellular carcinomas behave differently than benign lesions on ultrasound contrast. This was a patient who had an ultrasound of the abdomen ordered for elevated LFTs. He had no recent prior imaging. He subsequently had a biopsy that showed that this was an HCC. Here we can see a large heterogeneous liver mass in both a longitudinal as well as a transverse plane. Color Doppler is not terribly helpful within the lesion. We do see what appears to be a large feeding vessel in this lesion, as well as patency of the main portal vein. This is shortly after injection, five seconds after injection. This is a real life case because this patient started to squirm and you notice the transducer moving to make sure that we're in the region of the lesion prior to the contrast arriving, which we are. And here we can see that large vessel that we saw in color Doppler, but we have rapid enhancement of the lesion and irregular vessels within the lesion as well. There's a small amount of necrosis. We can see that there's not really ever filling in the center of this lesion. 
And as we continue to watch this lesion, we're getting into the portal venous phase now, that necrosis becomes a little more evident to us. If we had not been able to get back onto the lesion with the patient moving, as the patient is doing again here, if we had not been able to get back onto that lesion in time, we could perform a second injection. That is a valuable tool in ultrasound contrast that we don't have in other areas of imaging. As we continue to watch this lesion, we notice that there's actually more enhancement in the surrounding liver now than in the lesion. So we have some washout. That is evident in malignancies and in HCCs, it can sometimes take a little longer. So three or four or five minute intervals may be needed to follow these lesions. But the washout is evident here and that's going to continue over time. In fact, we are two minutes post-injection now and there is obvious washout in the lesion as compared to the remainder of the liver. Very different from the benign lesions we just looked at. Metastases have washout on ultrasound contrast as well. This patient has known gastric cancer and a new liver lesion. She also has a very large right pleural effusion as we see here. Here is a solitary liver lesion we will be examining. This is in transverse. We're actually going to dose in longitudinal. So here is this target lesion. Notice that the left side of the screen is intentionally black so we can listen just for harmonic signals. This is one second after injection. And based on the patient's status, we may have a slightly delayed washing time. This patient is ill. It's gonna take a little bit longer for the contrast to get there. We saw a little bit of backflow into the hepatic veins. We know it's on our way, its way, but be patient. So here we can see the arterial phase. There is no question where this lesion is. And almost as quickly as we have fill in, okay, we start to have wash out of this lesion as well. Okay, so we're continuing to watch this lesion. Okay, and notice that the center is becoming less and less vascular. Okay, that is consistent with washout. So we have to watch a lesion over a period of time, what happens in the arterial phase as well as what happens in the portal venous phase and in the late phase. We can see within a minute though, we have characterized this lesion as being malignant. And if you look at the borders of the lesion, almost the entire lesion has washed out. After we have imaged the lesion and characterized it, it is helpful to scan the entire liver and look for other areas of malignancy that we may not have known existed. So we can sweep the liver. We know that malignancies at this point in the injection are going to appear as hypovascular or sometimes um, Dr. Barr will refer to these as black holes. So we'll sweep the liver to look for additional lesions. This can be very important if the patient is going to have an ablative procedure or surgery. Okay, now it's time for a quiz. So you must play along at home as you are watching this video. This is a 45-year-old male who had left-sided abdominal pain. He had an outside facility perform a CT without contrast because there was a concern about a kidney stone. That was what the referring physician was concerned with. So he did not have anything wrong with his left kidney. However, we can see this lesion in the patient's liver. It's about three by three and a half centimeters in size. So this is a longitudinal image. Okay, in transverse, we can see the lesion as well. A little bit of posterior acoustic enhancement is visualized and color Doppler is not revealing. The sensitivity and specificity of color Doppler to characterize liver lesions we know is exceptionally poor. In addition, however, there is a lesion in his right kidney that was not noted on the CT without contrast. This makes characterizing this liver lesion now of paramount importance. The kidney lesion is about 2.7 by 2.4 centimeters in size and will need characterized as well. So 12 seconds after an injection is where we pick up and our liver lesion is going to be in this region. Okay, so we're looking around, the contrast is just now arriving. Okay, and here is the region of our lesion. 
So think about what we just talked about with the enhancement patterns. Okay, we're going to continue to watch this lesion. And again, keep the lesion in plane as the, pati as the patient breathes so we can get a fuller picture of what's happening throughout the various enhancement phases in the liver, the vascular phases. Okay, are you coming up with a diagnosis yet? Okay, so I'm going to stop our clip for now. And if we look at the enhancement pattern, we notice that we did not have rapid enhancement, but instead we have centripetal fill-in from the outside in. So globular appearance to the contrast as it appears, this is consistent with a hemangioma. And in fact, this is about a minute after injection, we see this globular appearance, and this is a hemangioma. Okay, this is three minutes after injection, and this lesion did completely fill in. It took about five minutes. In addition, with a second injection, because we can do so, we characterize his liver lesion. This is a hypervascular lesion. This is 13 seconds after the injection. This was um, a minute after injection by going back and um, capturing this from a clip. That's why there's the time differential here. And this turned out to be renal cell carcinoma as hypervascular masses do. So it's very important to this patient that we characterize his hemangioma correctly. How do we perform a contrast enhanced exam? We use harmonic contrast software and different manufacturers use it differently. We may use pulse inversion or phase inversion or amplitude modulation. The goal of all of these techniques is to cancel out the fundamental information and only visualize the harmonic signals that are produced by the contrast agents. The image settings in the abdomen are agent-specific rather than organ-specific. We have spent many years working with the manufacturers to ensure that we have optimal settings. And so that is one thing that should not be a concern for sonographers is the equipment settings. We may need to modify these slightly depending on patient body habitus or the lesion being examined, but it is pretty much push-button technology for the most part now, which is really beneficial in being sure that this can be implemented in a number of settings. The initial settings in the exam protocols are already established. For the most part, as you can see, it's very important to stay in one plane and capture information that can then be later examined in real time. As far as how we can perform this in a radiology setting and what we do in our practice, the patient needs to be identified as to the need for ultrasound contrast imaging. The informed consent in our center is a verbal consent. When the patient registers for the exam, the patient will sign a consent saying that they have been ordered to have an ultrasound with contrast and they sign the same in the same manner as patients who are having CT with contrast or MRI contrast. The examination is then explained to them in the room and a verbal consent is obtained at that time. The IV must be at least a 20 gauge. If absolutely necessary, a 22 gauge has been used, but if the gauge is too small, the pressure is going to um, potentially burst contrast bubbles, which would defeat the purpose of injecting contrast. So we try to stick with a 20 gauge. We activate the drug, and depending on the contrast agent we're using, that can be done in different manners. We are then going to use a three-way stopcock. We don't want to use extension tubing, especially if it's a small bore tubing, because that can um, lead to bursting of bubbles as well. This is the setup that we use in our setting. We use a stopcock, and wherever the stopcock is pointing is what is actually stopped or not flowing. So we will put the contrast on the straight portion to deliver it directly into the vein, and then the stopcock will be readjusted and the saline flush will be delivered. Here we can see the stopcock. We're going to perform a standard exam before injection and localize the lesion. It is acceptable to place a small mark on the patient's skin to know exactly which plane you want to scan in. 
We're going to activate the contrast specific software and activate dual screen in most instances. And then confirm the settings. Be sure that we have low MI, which is what the ultrasound contrast software should default to, and confirm that we have a three minute clip as well. Performing a contrast injection requires two people. The sonographer is going to be scanning and that transducer needs to be in place prior to the injection. You saw how quickly the contrast actually arrives at the lesion of interest. So a second person is needed to perform the injection. The person who performs the injection can be a nurse or another imaging technologist or a resident or a fellow or a radiologist. It depends upon the requirements in your facility and in your state. So the contrast agent will be injected followed by a saline flush. We inject at a rate of about one ml per second and the same is true for the contrast agent as well as the flush. We're going to start the contrast timer at the beginning of the flush and start our clip store. We're going to save up to three minutes and then we can do intermittent imaging to watch hemangiomas fill or HCC, HCCs wash out. We're going to collect data as long as needed for the patient. Typically, we're going to stay in one position to begin with and then perhaps sweep the liver. We're going to have that lesion in plane while the patient's breathing and instruct the patient to breathe shallowly. No deep breaths that would take that lesion out of our field of view. If we need another injection, we can do that while the patient is with us and on the table. If we don't, we can end the study and then go back at that time and acquire any still images we may need. We can remove the IV and the patient is discharged from the department. The where and when are up to the facility. Some facilities may have one day that they do contrast studies. That is what we do in our facility. We have a single day per week dedicated so the machine is already assigned and the room is blocked for such things. However, some facilities may decide to plan differently and that is up to the facility. Keep in mind, however, when we talk about when, that there's a limited use of the contrast agent after activation. So you don't want to activate all of the drug you might use for the day in the morning. It is best to activate that agent right before you're ready to use the agent. If you see any settling in the vial and the vial does not look milky, you may have to reactivate just by shaking the vial just prior to injection. As far as who has what roles in the exam, we're going to talk about that um, as well. This is a paradigm shift for sonographers. We are used to not dealing with IVs for the most part and not dealing with contrast agents in a radiology setting. This is not as much of a paradigm shift for radiologists because they're already accustomed to interpretation of both CT and MRI with contrast. Sonographers are going to need to be familiar with the scanning technique and the pattern recognition and realize that this does add a short amount of time to the examination. We also have a non-invasive mindset. Some labs even say non-invasive ultrasound lab on the sign. That, however, is a misnomer. We have transducers that have been designed to place in every body cavity. We perform transvaginal sonography and transrectal sonography, and those are certainly invasive type exams. So an IV is no more invasive than any other types of exams we already perform in our department. There are models that we can draw from in cardiology, and so some of these papers were published earlier in the cardiology experience, and some are more recent. Contrast agents were approved in cardiology at the turn of the century, around 2000-2001. And so the experiences from cardiology tell us that there needs to be a team approach and the medical director needs to be committed to the quality of the contrast program. The radiologist can work with referring physicians to increase awareness of the fact that this is a service being offered in your facility, and this will help increase the utilization of contrast. The radiologist can also state in the impression that contrast-enhanced ultrasound may be beneficial in this patient in the same way that he or she would dictate that a contrast-enhanced CT or MRI would be beneficial. The sonographer must understand the equipment optimization, being that we use a very low MI, and again, this is part of the standard contrast package. 
We need to realize that contrast will add time to the exam. Once the workflow has been decided, it does not add more than about five to 10 minutes to the exam in most cases. We are responsible for explaining the procedure to the patient, possibly inserting the IV, although in most settings that may not be probable if the sonographer does not have those skills. Even if the sonographer inserts the IV, we're going to need an additional sonographer or nurse or um, personnel to do the injection. The sonographer must have the transducer in place at the time of injection. So we're going to need availability of other personnel to perform the actual injection. That person only needs to be available during the injection time, not during the entire exam. In a more recent paper, Dr. Thomas Porter, in speaking about the experience in echocardiography, said that establishment of IV access remains one of the biggest obstacles to administering ultrasound contrast agents in the echocardiography setting. This means that as labs begin to consider implementing and utilizing contrast agents, the workflow must be determined. And whether that IV is placed prior to the standard exam or during the standard exam depends on the facility. But a lot of facilities have interventional radiology procedure areas that could be utilized for this purpose. There is currently reimbursement available for an ultrasound of the abdomen with contrast, for the administration of contrast, and a HCPCS code for the actual contrast material. I want to talk about two technological advances that can help in determination of lesion characterization. The first of these is FLASH, and each manufacturer has a setting that is known as FLASH, which is using a few frames of high MI technology to briefly burst the bubbles and watch the reperfusion of a lesion. This allows us to look at a particular region of interest and hopefully characterize it. However, realize there's a limited number of bubbles available. So we cannot use this technology three or four minutes into the injection. So here we can see the flash and then notice the reperfusion of the lesion. And in this lesion, we'll wait till it flashes again. Okay, we can see the spokes of the wheel appearance and this is an FNH. The other thing we can do is look at the contrast dynamics or the time intensity curves that can be generated similar to MRI. We can evaluate the perfusion of a region of interest and generate time intensity curves. We're going to go back and look at our patient with the adenoma and this yellow region of interest is placed in the adenoma. The green region of interest is placed in the normal hepatic parenchyma. And as we watch this, if you look at the bottom of the screen, this line right here is as time is proceeding. So we can see the washing of the contrast right here. Okay, notice that both the yellow and the green curves go up greatly as the contrast has arrived. And then as we continue to watch, we notice that the region of the adenoma, the yellow, has a greater number of bubbles or greater enhancement than the green. So if um, the interpreting physician does not trust his or her own eyes to determine that, this is a way to quantify this. This may be helpful in therapies as well. Most systems have this as an online, on the system option. And if it's not online, it can be done off of the system on an offline computer. Notice also as I restart this clip that the motion tracking technology has become much greatly improved over time. So if the patient is breathing shallowly, the regions of interest will actually follow the patient's breathing to allow for better tracking of bubbles. This is a benign lesion and we can see that the lesion remains enhanced and more greatly enhanced than the background liver. If this were a malignant lesion, we would see washout as we visually saw in the metastasis, and that washout would be at a much higher rate than the washout of the normal hepatic parenchyma. In summary, contrast enhanced ultrasound can be beneficial in a number of patients. It does require a team approach, 
with the medical director being in support of the program, with the sonographer being knowledgeable about contrast, and with the addition of other personnel who can act in support roles, especially in placing the IV and injecting. There is a defined need for appropriate clinical education. And so I hope that this program has been helpful to you in starting your journey toward using contrast-enhanced ultrasound. Thank you.